So welcome everyone to uh, tonight's Making Public Histories seminar. I'm Susie Prochke from Deakin University. I acknowledge to start off with the lands from which I'm speaking to you this evening as Wurundjeri people's lands where sovereignty has never been ceded and I pay my respects to Indigenous elders past and present. Tonight's seminar, Women's Lives, Women's Bodies, we decided to run this uh, topic um, to mark the centenary of the first birth control clinic, which was opened by Dr. Mary Stopes in London on the 17th of March, 1921. Um, we are going to, oh, for those of you who, for whom this is your first Making Public History seminar, I should say that um, the series is offered jointly by the Monash University History Program, the History Council of Victoria and the Old Treasury Building. Each of our events aims to explore issues and approaches in making public histories. The seminars are open to anyone interested in the creation and impact of history in contemporary society. And I'm very pleased that you've all joined us this evening. Before we begin, I'm just going to put this up to let those of you who haven't done a, a webinar before know how this works. So you can see us, um, but not each other. And what you can do if you want to ask a question is um, use the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a chat button, but we may not necessarily be looking there for Q and A's, um, we encourage you instead to use that for technical issues and things. Um, and we are recording the webinar tonight. We'll make that recording available um, after, after this evening. Do please keep your questions polite and respectful. You don't have to identify yourself. If you do, that's great, we'll read your name out. <laughs> um, my colleague, Alicia Chiratu, who is the Executive Officer and Secretary of the History Council of Victoria, will be running the, um, the question time at the end of each speaker's session and also the full question time at the end. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for the evening, who is Associate Professor Liz Connor um, of the History Program at La Trobe University. Liz is an AR the ARC Future Fellow on the project Graphic Encounters, Prince of Indigenous Australians. And she's the author of two books, Skin Deep, Settler Impressions of Aboriginal Women, and The Spectacular Modern Woman, Feminine Visibility, in the 1920s. Over to you, Liz. Liz, you mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, that wasn't helpful. Sorry. Um, I first want to add my voice to Susie's acknowledgement that I'm speaking from unceded country and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung elders past and present, some of whom I've met with to consult on my research into the colonial print archive and its often racist imagery. And I especially want to thank Malgana elder Aunty Pat Oakley, who I've talked with about one of the images I'm going to show, which she finds offensive. It is uncommonly generous of her to therefore approve me showing this derogatory image of her ancestors. And my thanks also to my colleague Susie Krotsky and all at the History Council of Victoria for inviting me to present tonight. At 5.21 exactly, it will be the Pornae, which is Wurundjeri tadpole season marked by the vernal or spring equinox. So the days get longer from now on. All right, so let me start. I'll share my screen and start with a warning. Um, well, that's interesting. <laughs> 
Um, this paper reproduces particular historic terms and imagery now considered derogatory and offensive in order to trace the cultural recurrence of racism in print and across its visual register, focusing tonight on cartooning. The cartoons I'm going to show are culturally sensitive and, and denigrating of Aboriginal people. As a researcher who has never experienced the racism these images entrenched, I acknowledge that for Aboriginal viewers, this may be challenging material to view. It is my hope that the analysis indicates my intention to intervene in their meaning and foster wider awareness of the history of representational discrimination and greater vigilance in the community against their uh, resurfacing meanings. It also needs to be foregrounded that these images did not go unchallenged by Aboriginal activists, firstly by Jack Patton in 1938 in his short-lived newspaper in which cartoons depicting Aboriginal people he said were cruel, and then in the first formal complaint in 1980 by the Redfern Aboriginal Legal Service, um, possibly his son Cecil against this cartoon by Eric Jolliffe. And I write up the whole relationship of these two moments to um, 18, the 18C inquiry in the engine and it's, um, I don't know, 2017, I think. All right, so Bill Leake's um, response to Four Corners revelations of the abuse of Aboriginal teens in the detention centre in Darwin was published in The Australian in August 2016. While the nation reeled from footage of Dylan Hooder Dylan Voller hooded and bound, Leake chose this moment to accuse and vilify. But a closer look at the historical precedents for racialized cartooning in Australia reveals some telling legacies and one surprising absence. While the denigration of Aboriginal paternity has some precedents, here from Emil Mercier in 1924 and just as state child removal was formalizing, Aboriginal maternity barely registers in this, in this visual genre. In the 1920s, for example, cartoons of Aboriginal women um, eluded their maternity, yet referenced it tangentially through matronly figures in tattered Mother Hubbard dresses, splayed feet and distorted simian facial features, and often positioned on the threshold of the station homes they operated. This relatively sympathetic cartoon by Phil May in 1888 draws on a sort of nativity scene to lampoon the intrusive and unhelpful gaze of passerby settlers. A few months early, earlier, and sorry for the quality of this cartoon, uh, this image, May depicted New South Wales as a bad-tempered Aboriginal mother lampooning a speech Premier Henry Parks had made in which he claimed New South Wales is the mother of civilization in this part of the world. Parks, a federationist, is depicted as her young child being abused and abandoned by his mother, who is charged with infanticide but acquitted. I'll come back to this particularly vicious depiction of Aboriginal mothers as infanticidal. What was it about Aboriginal maternity in particular that so threatened settler Australians as to provoke such malicious deprecation? And why did Aboriginal mothers appear so seldomly in cartoons compared to the colonial photographic archive and others? Given the wholesale disrespect and abuse Aboriginal people have come in for decades in cartoons, it is more than surprising that Aboriginal maternity is largely eluded as a topic of lampooning, particularly when you consider what was being said about Aboriginal mothers. As noted, the most pervasive motif about Aboriginal maternity was that Aboriginal mothers were infanticidal cannibals. From an almost de definitive study of every press mention of Aboriginal mothers, there is absolutely no credible evidence for this. Instead, there is an upsurge in print reports of court proceedings against white women of the serving girl variety who were charged with infanticide. This trope of Aboriginal mothers as infanticidal cannibals is related to dying race theory and also to shifts in European ideals of the mother, the child and the family and their relation to notions of the primordial, the primordial primitive mother. Primeval maternity was embodied by the native mother, universal and idealised principles of the feminine became exotic when realized under the rubric of racial difference. The primordial mother conveyed the sense that maternity is an impervious natural category of human existence, aesthetically and spiritually uplifting. For Europeans at the time of invasion, maternity evinced the natural state of womankind. At this most feminine principle increasingly required regulation and rationalization by men of science. The native mother confirmed that reproduction was the universal function and role of sexual difference. But as with the noble savage, this trope was bookended by the ignoble savage mother. 
In the face of manifest child mortality and disease on the frontier and in its aftermath, newcomer observers resorted to the ready defence of the incompetent and unnatural native mother, an allegation that arguably was revived through the Northern Territory Emergency Response Intervention. Child mortality thereby fitted neatly within and even magnified dying race theory, infertility, uh, dying race theory for over a century from the 1830s. Infanticide provided an, expla an explanation for the tragic decline in fertility and the visible absence of children in the camps and an injunction to take up emptying lands. Aboriginal mothers were said to be inept gathering their children into the cul-de-sac of race suicide or dying race, which was conveniently realized through the damning indictment of, in of infanticide with the additional slur of child cannibalism. And that additional slur is particular to Australia. No one else was that nasty. Added to these spooling tropes with the barbaric funeral rites of carrying body parts of deceased children, prolonged breastfeeding and hasty postpartum recuperation, the suckling, the charge of suckling whelps, along with overindulgent parenting and cloying attachment. Infanticide was never witnessed firsthand, yet it provided an alibi for staggering infant mortality, along with declining fertility in the contact zones. Congenital syphilis was the most likely cause for this infant mortality, it being noted by a number of observers. But infanticide and cannibalism were, even before European settlement in Australia, already entrenched tropes in imperial culture. Along with polygamy, they comprised the trilogy of savagery, discursively deployed by colonial powers around the globe to dehumanise First Nations peoples as savage, primitive and unworthy, conveniently, of their own lands. Yet throughout the centuries of exploration and colonisation, infanticide had been practised extensively in the West, and rather than being exceptional, scholarship has found it has been the rule. It was practice amongst all people, lacking fertility control as a response to privation, illness, deformity, illegitimacy, or population pressures, but was increasingly criminalized in Europe from the late medieval period. Unmarried domestic servants recent, uh, sorry, dominate recent historiography of infanticide, yet despite a print panic in mid-Victorian Britain and Australia over an apparent rise in white convictions, it was never said that infanticide comprised white custom or that this practice was characterised um, characterized white maternity in general. Why were settlers so threatened by Aboriginal maternity that they resorted to this pernicious trope? So if children embody the future, by their hand, Aboriginal mothers decree the incumbency of their people's future and thereby the racial makeup of the nation, and just as white Australia was aspiring to racial homogeneity. The figure of the Aboriginal mother, whether detribalised or civilised, or the mother of full bloods or half castes, has thus been critical to the development, enactment and enforcement of all state policies directed at Aboriginal Australians, particularly at the administrative regimes of protection and assimilation. It was the interruption of the mother-child relation, principally through wide-scale child removal, that animated the 20th century objective to divest Australia of its original custodians. The maligning of Aboriginal maternity in colonial print served the settler colonial project of eradication of native custodianship over their lands and particularly the disinheritance of their rightful heirs, their children. Infanticide thus became an alibi for the dramatic depopulation newcomers observed conflated with race destiny or dying race theory and settlers' claims to, the nat to their natural succession to the land. Yet by the 1860s, speculative reports in the press of Aboriginal infanticide continued to be outweighed by criminal proceedings against named white women where the baby's uh, corpses were produced by roughly eight to one. This was a pervasive and unrelenting discourse of Aboriginal maternal incompetency and worse. Yet it did not transfer to the cartooning genre and its absence is as telling as the visualization of Aboriginal women as mostly post-maternal, their children notably absented. Aboriginal maternity was officially textually maligned, but visually effaced. This lithograph of the Malgana people, so this is Jacaraga who made this lithograph of the Malgana people, this is where they landed. Um, of Shark Bay by Jacques Arago, draftsman on Fraser uh, exploratory voyage of 1817, features an Aboriginal mother 
through exaggerated and disturbing uh, racial distortion. The expedition first moored off the westernmost point of, um, of New Holland on the 12th of September in 1818. Arago wrote despairingly, the coast from the moment we saw it exhibited nothing but a picture of desolation. Everywhere reigned sterility and death. And as you can see, it was clearly uh, hell on earth. Yet it was clearly inhabited. Arago ignored the entreaties of the 15 natives um, to return to his ship and leave. Instead, their appearance excited Arago with great joy. The people he pursued had a defiant look in their eye and beckoned him to move back to his ship. Yet so intent was he, indeed enchanted by the thought of documenting their features, he dismissed their entreaties and moved toward a third band of people up on the dunes, not here on the shoreline at all. Arago desired to enrich my atlas with some of those grotesque and curious scenes that excite so much interest and without which a work such as mine is dull and fatiguing. He had come among the Malgana people and knew his depiction of them as wretched and grotesque would excite interest in his published and illustrated journal. Journal. In Sydney, he followed a couple to a birth, a birthing, and watched the mother deliver. She spurned his cravat and handkerchief gifts. No doubt his presence was, was felt to be intrusive, but it added colour to his journal. Either Arago or the lith lithograph producers in Paris, Moran and Le Villain, resorted in the print examined to emerging conventions of facial and bodily distortion in cartoon at this time, itself potentially influenced by racialized caricature. Allowing for modesty poses, they appear to be in motion. While unsmiling, they are not avoidant or hostile, but it is their distended abdomens that draws the eye, an inference that their diet was woefully inadequate, as the spindly legs of the carried infant also suggests, conveying that they were barely subsisting in a sterile deathscape. The facial and bodily distortion that is coming to infuse cartooning at this time is deployed as a part of racial profiling of the malnourished scavenging savage. But something about Aboriginal maternity is being effaced in, in Arago's lithograph, namely the identification with the primordial mother. Where the Malgana's mother middle, mother's middle should swell with increase and supply for her unborn, in its place she shows, shows the signs of malnutrition and of barely being able to provide for herself or her extant child, let alone any prospective child. Significantly, the swollen empty stomach slur is extended to her menfolk, effacing any notion of sexual difference as embodied by the fertility of the primordial native mother. Like other French visitors to New Holland before him, Arago shuttled between the discursive extremes of ignoble and noble savage. For the ignoble, he seemed to leave us an early form of what we have since come to call racial profiling, as it intersected with the distortions of cartooning, as this genre took hold in European printing and publishing during this period. To conclude, in 1997, Pauline Hansen, in her maiden speech to Parliament, cited Daisy Bates, drawing on a claim she made in 1908 at Peak Hill, that every woman of that group arriving in camp had killed, cooked and eaten their babies. Hansen wanted to refute the romantic view of the Aborigines held by the new class and to assuage prevailing guilt about settlement. She added insult to the injury of former Federal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Peter Howson, who had defended decades of child removal as in fact rescuing thousands of babies from infanticide. These modern day echoes don't register in the cartoon genre. Aboriginal maternity was something of a blind spot. Its effacement mirrored the fantasy of dying race theory and the policy of assimilation, namely of racial decline. This absenting betrays that the logic of elimination of the native was strategically directed at the very source of Aboriginal inheritance, sovereignty and polity, the much maligned Aboriginal mother. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz that um, brought us right up to almost the present day, which is quite a lot to achieve in 15 minutes. Very impressive. Um, I can't see Alicia, but I'm going to now invite Alicia to take over uh, the Q&A. Um, for those of you who missed it, Alicia is the Executive Officer and Secretary of the History Council of Victoria. And I might just get her to come in now and invite um, members of the audience to use the Q&A um, to, uh, to give 
questions to to Liz. I'm here, Susie. All good. Thank you, and thank you, Liz, for that. Um, and as as Susie said, we sort of raced through, um, but you can see all of those connections that you're making for us and and sharing with us. So. Whilst everyone thinks about questions and pops them in the Q&A, um, I thought I'd ask you about, you know, the influence of cartooning. You sort of drawn that connection with the lithographs, lithographs and the, and the cartoons. How, how much, um, what was the popularity like in, in Europe? You were saying yeah. it, was, it was building. Uh, it 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 had um it had, I think it lithographs had been invented in 1796 I think but they really were taking hold in France by 1815 mm. and while France had a, a very healthy revolutionary cartooning tradition um, lampooning you know aristocrats the dilettantes and everyone in between um, uh, it it also it, it was able to do so from 1815. So this is just two years before Arago arrives at Shark Bay, um, largely because of the lithograph, and it really really mm. took off in the press from that from that time. So although this image um, by Arago isn't um, necessarily a cartoon, I just wanted to draw it into that tradition because of how grotesque the, the, the distortion and exaggeration is, which is normally mm. part of the cartooning genre. And think about, I guess, whether racialized distortion and some of which we might see in cartoons by um, Cruikshank mm. um, and Gilray um, and the French equivalent would be Eugène Delacroix. Um, whether racialized distortion from, from the exploratory voyages and the published output of those voyages might not have been influencing cartooning um, at the time. I guess that's mm. the question for me. Yes. I don't know that I can actually causally link it, yes. but I, I wonder whether that influence is in play mm. because, you know, they, they took a lot of liberties um, with, these, with these images. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and I was thinking about, you know, what impact, um, you know, or can can you draw out what impact these cartoons and these images, which are, you know, so transmissible and, and easy yeah. to read, regardless of, of someone's uh, ability to read words, they can read pictures. So yeah. what how did that impact the European view of Australia? Do you did you explore that in your work? Um, well, I guess all we can sort of do is look at subscriptions and and we I mean Arago's print went into 10 editions his journal went into 10 editions this one this image appears in the it came out in 1822 and it appears in the 1839 edition along with a lot of other pretty pernicious um cartoons uh sorry imagery um the thing is that Arago was quite an accomplished draftsman and he and he was able to draw um he drew a lot of Aboriginal people particularly Eora around Sydney in quite neoclassical terms as well mm. so this is a kind of deliberate um distortion but in terms of literacy uh and and sort of readership at the time you know literacy was pretty good in Europe it's better than I think a lot of us realize and um the, although the journals, the, the, like this, the, the 1839 edition was four volumes, um, and then there was the, the atlas, usually accompanying the, the, journal, the volumes, these were quite expensive, mm. but images from them would be re-inscribed by um, magazines and newspapers, and that is how they would have much wider circulation. Yes. And they would go round and around. So one image that I've traced of Aramaida, uh, a woman, a, a Tasmanian woman, um, from the Bodan expedition of 1800, I've so far found 16 reiterations of it. And she appears as a, as a Malay and as a um, Papuan, a Papuan. Um, sometimes uh, her name, mostly her name is completely dropped, even though it was there in the original Bodan Atlas. Mm. So we see this thing of, of, of anonymizing and using Aboriginal people to typify First Nations people all around the world. So mm. they are going, it's a good question, because they're certainly going around rapidly and appearing all over the place yeah. out of these journals. Yeah, that's right, as, as printing becomes more accessible. And we've got a question here from Carla who says, thanks for a fascinating presentation. 
Uh, you alluded in several places to the uncomfortable position of the historian in tracing racially stereotyped histories. Yeah. How do you navigate the ethics of this position while continuing this important research? Oh, thank you. That's a really, really important question. Mm -hmm. Look, when I first came across these images, particularly the ones I first showed in the 1920s, I was doing my PhD and I was researching the flapper. I wasn't really thinking very hard about race at all. And um, uh, I, I, my initial response was to just turn it over. I just thought, oh, my God, these, these are just, um, I just was so shocked. Um, but at the time, I was setting a campaign up on native title um, that we did the, um, the armbands and the house plaques that you see around. Um, mm. And we were trying to, you know, do to, to create awareness about native title and what was happening with John Howard's 10 point plan. Um, and I felt very strongly that the kind of, you know, the, the culture wars were really taking hold in terms of race and, and some of these tropes were recirculating and I felt that they needed to, uh, uh, to be explained and that, that, that some of these tropes, particularly of, of infanticidal mothers appearing in Parliament in 1997, really needed to be traced back to their beginnings and disproven and that's what I did in Skin Deep. Um, my book um, in the maternity chapter. Um, that said, there is an ethical warp in me presenting uh, imagery that that displays something I've never experienced, and that's racism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's very hard to resolve that that warp. And so what I do is when I can localize an image like this one here um, from Arago, I go back to the community and and get in touch with them and um, send it to them and, it's, and with a warning um, and mm. eventually get into a dialogue and a conversation about how they feel about me presenting this imagery. So yes. Auntie Pat Oakley knows that I presented this image last week at the University of Newcastle and this week. Um, and also, but the, the, the difficulty, the biggest difficulty is that I can't always localise the images, like those images of the, okay. of the Mother Hubbard women are just some woman on a station somewhere. Um, so the best thing I can do there, I think, is to talk to the Wurundjeri Elders Council or the Cultural Heritage Committee here in Melbourne, and I've talked with them about some of the work that I'm doing. So it's a thing about getting into discussion and dialogue, um, showing what my intentions are. They're, they're really almost activist, I, I, I hope. <laughs> that's, mm. my, that's my kind of um, uh, aim to intervene in the meanings and also to, to create more vigilance about the recirculation of these meanings. You know, infanticide in Australia as a kind of common practice was disproven mm. in the 1920s. So was the, the, the bride capture trope. For it to be resurfacing now, for it to have inflections in the Northern Territory emergency response, I think you know, it creates uh, an imperative to historicise those tropes and understand them better. I hope that answers your question, but I don't think I can ever fully answer it, but thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, and thanks thanks everyone for questions. We've got some great ones in the Q&A, but we, we might end up holding them to our, our last group, group Q&A. So back to Susie. Good idea. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, um, Liz. Liz, if I could get you to unshare your screen, thank you, while I um, introduce Associate Professor Paula Michaels, who is up next. Um, Paula is uh, Associate Professor in the History Department and Head of History at Monash University and the author of two prize-winning books, Lamar's and International History and Curative Powers, Medicine and Empire in Stalin's Central Asia, um, among a whole list of other things, uh, and has recently been published as one of the editors on the new book, Gender and Trauma, since 1900. So if you'd like to hop on, Paula, we'd love to hear you. Thank you, Susie. Um, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I want to uh, thank the History Council for the invitation to share my work with you today. And I want to begin by acknowledging 
the Boon Warang, Bunurong, and Wurundjeri Woi Warang peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation as traditional owners and custodians of the unceded lands from which I'm speaking and to pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about obstetric violence and traumatic birth in uh, the Soviet Union and um, I, and giving birth in the USSR was, uh, as I suspect everyone in the audience would guess, a um, deeply and unforgettably distressing experience. But first and foremost, it was distressing at the hands of those who were charged with their care. My presentation today asks, how was psychological suffering in childbirth understood in the post-war USSR? A central life cycle event, childbirth has been the object of robust historical study in recent decades. And it's often portrayed as a tug of war between male medical authority and female autonomy. As a universal biological phenomenon that unfolds in a historically contingent technological and social landscape of, among other things, the meaning of a relationship to pain and suffering, um, birth casts into sharp relief both the national peculiarities and uh, transnational phenomena. The Soviet case offers an important counterpoint to a historiography that is centered on Western Europe and North America, lacking grassroots second wave feminist activism to press for birth reform. And without the leverage of market forces, care at Soviet maternity homes remained at best indifferent and at worst inhumane throughout the second half of the 20th century. At the same time, Soviet authorities and the public did not share the Freudian inflected language of neurosis, hysteria, and later post-traumatic stress disorder to explain women's psychological suffering and birth. Experiences in the USSR thus allow us to ask what did traumatic birth look like in a national context uh, that did not share the same psychological framing. So my analysis is informed by the concept of obstetric violence, a 21st century concept that encompasses disregard for women's needs uh, and pain, denial of treatment during childbirth, forced and coerced medical interventions, um, invasive practices, unnecessary use of medication, detention and facilities for failure to pay and physical violence. Practices that might seem more familiar in our context include verbal humiliation, dehumanizing or rude treatment, the dis and discrimination based on race, ethnic or economic background, age, HIV status or gender nonconformity. While the concept of obstetric violence did not exist in the Soviet era, it serves to draw our attention to women's unique vulnerability in birth, the wide ranging forms that violence can take and the systemic institutionalized nature of those violations. So it isn't down to just one, women, one woman's uh, experience and that being a single data point, but we see the way in which it's systemic. Now to, to explore these questions in the Soviet context, I lean on an admittedly scant source base that reveals competing narratives of traumatic birth experiences. Generated by psychologists on the one hand, medical narratives tell a story of the pl that places the onus for traumatic birth primarily on the individual. The work here of psychologist I.Z. Velvovsky, who was active professionally from the 1940s through the 1960s, forms the centerpiece of my analysis. A accessing women's understandings of their own experiences, however, is a little bit tricky in the Soviet context. Soviet prudery meant that the kinds of birth stories published in Western women's magazines in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond have no parallel in the Soviet context, while censorship in those decades made criticism of state maternity care services uh, a difficult topic to broach. But we can piece together some sense of women's experiences by casting a kind of wide net for um, indirect evidence. Uh, works of literature, 
appeared in the late 1980s and 90s that provide a window uh, onto what transpired in Soviet maternity wards and other sources that unfortunately I don't have time to, uh, to go into with you today, uh, but inform my overall argument include newspapers, film, and recollections that are posted on social media in the beginning of the 21st century. Almost alone among Soviet researchers in his concern with birth trauma, Vilvovsky built an international reputation through his work on psychological approaches to obstetric pain management. And his 1963 book offers about two dozen case histories that deal specifically with perinatal and postpartum trauma, depression, and psychosis. And these case histories let us ask how birth trauma was understood in a context in which Freudianism was rejected. Vilvovsky relies on the explanatory power of Pavlovian physical psychology. So uh, think uh, ringing bells and salivating dogs uh, with its emphasis on the workings of the nervous system and the role of suggestion and conditioning in the establishment of uh, of, of a psychological response. Of greatest importance to Velvovsky is the role played by the nervous system, specifically the balance of the cortical and subcortical function. Women exhibit personality or what he called character types based not on early psychosexual development as Freud and his disciples would have it, but on the physical properties of their nervous system, its strength, its balance, its agility. Take, for example, the case of 26-year-old first-time mother S, who Velvovsky's, in Velvovsky's estimation, quote, gave the impression of not being entirely normal during her antenatal preparation and at the time of her admission to the maternity ward in labor. Velvovsky distrusts her evaluation of her, the extent of her pain, and he asserts that her rejection uh, her reaction to the pain outstripped the strength of, his, of her contractions. She became distressed and according to Velvovsky screamed, quote, give me anesthesia, give me a knife to cut myself, I don't want to give birth. She was so unmanageable and so distressed that they did everything they could to calm her down and to speed up her labor, including administering two modest doses of an amphetamine, uh, which which immediately allegedly um, uh, uh, led her to, as Velvovsky put it, conduct herself absolutely calmly and with composure. She then birthed her baby vaginally and as Velvovsky put it, exhibited no further strangeness. He explained her behavior strictly through a neurological process known as reciprocal induction, overstimulation leading to cortical inhibition and uninhibited subcortical function. When we look beyond sources generated by the medical establishment, it becomes evident that it's actually the conditions in the maternity wards themselves that contribute to women's emotional distress in labor and birth. In the Soviet Union's last years, a number of women writers pen stories that were set in whole or in part in maternity wards. And these narratives attribute women's mental anguish to indifferent and even cruel treatment that compounded the fears and trying personal circumstances they carried with them into their birth experiences. Formed in 1988, a women's writing group known as the New Amazons made maternity, the maternity ward a primary site for exploring women's roles and social position. In the words of literary scholar Elizabeth Skomp, a wide range of attitudes toward maternity and women's reproduction, reproductive potential acts as perhaps the quintessential site of uniquely female experience. These writers present not radiant, voluptuous, fecund bodies, but battered, spent women. Marina Pallier, for example, in The Loser's Ward, describes women suffering as visible, quote, on their glistening bodies as if on a map, the mastitis scars on their sagging breasts, the cesarean scars on their bellies, the drooping string-like veins on their ruined legs, the swollen stretch marks on their withered hips, flabby bellies, folding like aprons or purses um, from having given birth so many times. Suffering 
in birth is thus revealed as a nearly universal marker of the female experience, a wound that women carry around as with them as casually and as routinely as other signifiers of womanhood, like an apron or a purse. While part of women's suffering is presented as intrinsic to birth itself, the new Amazon's stories also underscore how the physical space and the staff of maternity wards often offer no comfort in women's time of greatest need. In the story, How Lake Jolly Came About, Nina Gorlanova describes the stench of bleach and urine overlaid with a sickening waft of watermelon, which sent her protagonist Masha's head spinning. Dozens of mosquitoes swarmed, uh, uh, sh she writes, uh, while plaster hung in shreds from the ceiling. In Pallier's Provincial Obstetrics and Gynecology Department, um, patients there meet the smells of re the, a reeking uh, quote of ether and institutional soup. The dreary atmosphere is ratcheted up in Yelena Makarova's For Preservation, which notes that the morgue is positioned directly over the maternity ward's window. Pestilence and death haunt the space, hovering menacingly on the periphery of the altered consciousness of the women in labor. The new Amazons capture the indifferent and sometimes cruel treatment to which Soviet women were subjected in maternity wards. Set in 1943, but originally published in 1981, Irina Grekova's Ship of Widows describes how one new mother, loudly demanding that her baby be handed over to her right after birth, was told by a nurse, shh, this isn't a marketplace. There are hundreds of you lying here, and you're the only one making a fuss. We're all working here, and you're squealing like a pig. When Gorlanova's Masha goes into hard labor, she shouts for assistance down the corridor to a midwife asleep at her desk. In response, the midwife, quote, opened her eyes wide for a second and then apparently deciding she was having a dream about a person on all fours, calmed down and went back to sleep. Masha then crawls back into bed and gives birth alone with the midwife running in only at the, at the cries of the newborn. Called to stitch up her perineum, the doctor gripes that Masha was, quote, all torn up, I'll be sewing all night and then scolds the exhausted Masha to make an effort. Um, while Masha's experience of unattended birth is certainly extreme, Soviet women were by and large alone, both figuratively and often literally. The laboring woman was not allowed to bring with her anyone for additional support. While there was no law against it, a sense of propriety stood in the way as well as the practicalities of uh, there being no private rooms in Soviet maternity wards. Uh, no nurse or midwife accompanied an individual woman um, through the course of her labor, checking on women only uh, when their cries demanded it um, or when they were about to deliver. Some might argue that the USSR was a tough place where gruff treatment from stony-faced workers in medical and other professions was typical. It's fair to ask, is it ahistorical to think that Soviet women would have thought this treatment cruel? Are these literary sources mere representations of a reality that to our eyes look like violence, or are they offered as a critique? Can they be both unremarkable and potentially traumatic? Um, Harvard psychology professor and clinician Richard McNally rightly asserts that, quote, what counts as trauma varies as a function of context. He goes on, uh, I'm sorry, not only will different individuals react to stressors in different ways, but the perception of those events, even as stressors, is not necessarily transhistorical. He goes on to assert, however, that, quote, perhaps one unfortunate consequence of the undeniable, otherwise undeniable benefits of modernity is diminished resilience. Our relatively greater comfort, safety, health, and well-being may have rendered us more vulnerable to stressors 
far less toxic than ones occurring in earlier eras. By logical extension, McNally might argue uh, that Soviet women would have would not find these conditions distressing, let alone traumatic, as they were made more resilient by the harsh conditions to which they had been exposed all their lives and to which they were thus accustomed. But the weight of evidence, however, seems categorically to suggest otherwise. In the early 1980s, American sociologist Jean Ispa set out to study Soviet women's experiences in labor and birth in comparison to their American counterparts. And she finds that by comparison, Particularly striking was the level of fear about pain and fetal injury that Soviet women expressed. While fear in childbirth is a trans-historical, trans-cultural phenomenon, Ispa argues that her findings were not simple artifacts of tradition, as she puts it. Um, the quality of Soviet medical care had perhaps declined in the um, 50s and 60s, or rather in the 60s and early 70s, because and, and the indicator of that is a rise in infant mortality. Knowing that pharmacological pain relief was rarely used, Soviet women awaited labor's onset with dread. Added to this was the fact that as Ispa writes, quote, almost all the women interviewed recalled impersonal, often gruff treatment by medical personnel, little medical attention during labor, poor sanitation and food in the postnatal recovery room. In, in other words, describing exactly the scenes that we see by looking at literary sources. When ISPA's findings are thus taken together with literary evidence, it seems reasonable to assert that distressing experiences were common, they may indeed have been traumatic for some women, and the ubiquity of these experiences did not diminish the trauma of them. Moreover, while the details differ, it's important to note that obstetric violence and trauma in childbirth is not unique to the Soviet context. What is in fact um, surprising is the almost universality of such experiences and their persistence over time and place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Paula. It occurred to me listening to your talk, we should have perhaps given a little trigger warning there <laughs> for, for I to say you. <laughs> yeah. violence right in the title there. Sorry, I know. I, I apologize. Yeah. If, uh, yes, you're it right. It is upsetting content. For sure. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, we've got already some great questions. So I'm going to hand over straight away to, um, to Alicia. Thanks, Susie, and thanks, Paula, um, for taking us through that story. Um, it, our first question comes from Nicole, and she says, did Soviet women give birth at home at all with lay midwives, or did they mainly give birth in hospitals? Uh, that's a great question. And in the period, in the post-war period that I'm looking at, in urban areas, they gave birth in hospital settings. In rural areas, uh, it was kind of mixed, um, but it, 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 in, this, in this period, especially once we're into like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. um, we're already dealing with um, professionally trained midwives giving birth in maternity centers. Yeah, okay. And Margie sort of got a, a follow-up question there too around the implication of some of the stories you referenced suggests unregulated fertility. Was birth control limited in the Soviet Union at that time? Was that state policy or was there something else happening? So I'm not sure what, what I said that would suggest that, but um, I can say that um, fertility was primarily limited in the Soviet Union through uh, abortion in the period after 1955. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the average Soviet woman in the 1970s and 80s had nine abortions and other methods of birth control were not widely available. Mm. Okay. And you were, you were talking a little bit, I, I like the word prudery that you were talking about in, in terms of the culture. And have you found that Soviet or, or Russian women were experiencing trauma in the ways that that other women were experiencing that through birth across the world? 
Uh, so I, I, what I have from other sources uh, suggests that, but they didn't have the language mm. of trauma to explain it. And um, there was a sense of, well, this is how it is. So women had a kind of um, matter of fact attitude um, that, that didn't really allow them to dwell on their suffering uh, mm -hmm. because they saw it, nothing unique about it. And um, I would say that the same is also true in um, other places that I've looked at, Australia, the United States, Great Britain, and France. Um, you know, also they don't have the same language of what today we would call post-traumatic stress disorder, but there is a sense of, of um, you know, the, during the heyday of Freudianism, it attributed those traumatic experiences not to structural problems in the delivery of maternity care, but to the psychological susceptibility and weakness of individual women. And were, were the literary sources that you used, was that, um, you know, why was that an okay way to kind of tell these stories? Was it because it perhaps could have been fiction, even though your research shows that it, it likely wasn't? Yeah, interesting question. So, so um, yes, it, there's a certain plausible deniability mm. in them being fiction is one part of it. The other thing is that they come from a later period, the late 1980s, when things are opening up in the Soviet Union because of Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev, this you know, greater openness. And that allows through literature, as well as other arenas, uh, more open conversation. And so you still have a sense of decorum inhibiting those public conversations mm -hmm. of women's real experiences, but that's not holding true in fictionalized versions of mm. it. And were there, um, there's a question sort of around oral histories. So, you know, what other, were there um, widespread conversations around, or if there weren't widespread conversations around women and childbirth so much in the, in the public arena, but has there been other research and perhaps oral histories on this time, yeah. Yeah, so um, in the 1990s, Indiana University historian David Ransel um, led uh, an oral history project that looked at women in Tatarstan who were ethnically Russian and some were ethnic Tatars. And among the things that they talked about was childbirth experiences in the, um, these were women who were already very elderly and uh, so they reflected on childbirth experiences from 60 years earlier in the 1930s. Um, and so they, they don't really speak to the period I'm interested in, but there is that work out there. And beyond that, there's only uh, really fragmentary snippets in larger projects. And there still is a sense of, well, this is not something you talk about to people. Uh, that's kind of tamping down a more open conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Paula, for answering all of our questions. We've got a couple more still to hold off till the end, but over to Susie now. Great. Thank you. So it's time to introduce um, our last speaker for the evening, Charlotte Greenhouch, um, who is Senior Lecturer at the University of Waikato in New Zealand and the author of Aging in 20th Century Britain. And Charlotte has commenced a new research project on what she's about to be discussing with us tonight. So we look forward to reading all about that as well. Over to you, Charlotte. Thanks so much, Susie. <clears throat> and it's really um, so great to be joining the History Council of Victoria from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, and I can see some former colleagues from Monash University in the audience and some current collaborators. So hello, everybody. Um, so. In 1991, Lois Edmund described being pregnant with her daughter. The baby was our little fish, our frog, our hidden swimmer, our octopus, all arms and legs, our slug in its bed of water. Loris was pregnant for the first time in 1947, aged 22, and she went on to have six children by her early 30s. 
Later, in 1975, she published her first book of verse at the age of 51, won the Penn Best First Book Award, and launched her career as an author and poet. <clears throat> Loris's accounts of her experiences of pregnancy are particularly vivid. Her words direct us inwards to consider the physical sensations of pregnancy alongside the inner worlds of pregnant people. In 1947, Loris felt that pregnancy was a project she shared with her husband, Trevor. The couple discussed every detail, well, almost. In 1948, when their daughter was eight months old, they mourned together when Loris miscarried. Part of the reason for Loris's close identification with her husband was the relative distance of her mother, friends, and doctors. Her mother was a kind, fun-loving grandmother, but, quote, she wasn't active in these intimate ways, and she didn't give advice about childbirth or feeding a baby. Among friends, Loris did not dwell on her discoveries. Quote, we would just say to each other, isn't this interesting, and this is the way it feels, and then I'd think about something else. Her doctors, meanwhile, quote, did a lot of poking around, but what they found out was their business, not yours. For all of these reasons, the couple were devoted readers of Helen Dean's 1945 Plunkett Manual, Modern Mothercraft, a publication that softened but did not dismantle the strict instructions Truby King had laid down for pregnant women and mothers since 1908. <clears throat> In 1947, Loris, quote, read and reread Deem's version and, quote, knew by heart its momentous lists of maternal and infant gear. On Deem's advice, Loris quit smoking, ate fruit and vegetables, and walked the recommended four miles a day. I hear her confidence in her body, making perfect conditions for my baby, in her description of those walks. Loris points us to a range of barriers to intimate discussions of pregnancy during the 1940s. She did not have in-depth conversations with her partners, as her parents, doctors, or friends. But Loris's writing also highlights new possibilities that she found by reading advice books and by confiding in her partner. Tonight, I want to look at some of the barriers and possibilities for archival research on the history of pregnancy in New Zealand. Women's diaries indicate how nascent discussions of pregnancy in the 1940s developed into full and complex records by the 1980s. Patricia Hallinan's diary begins in 1939 when she was 22 and her eldest child, Peter, was six months old. Patricia and her husband, Percy, had six children by 1946. And Patricia would continue writing her diary until her eyesight failed in 2013. In 1945, the couple's daughter, Betty, was born with spina bifida and lived for only 10 days. <clears throat> Patricia's diaries are vivid and chatty. Her regular entries record farm work, domestic work, socializing, trips to the cinema, twice yearly holidays with family and parenting. Each one of her six births arrives unexpectedly on these busy pages. In August, 1939, Patricia signaled that baby number two was due in about two months because she was sewing new clothes. An entry in October that year referenced, quote, the big event due tomorrow. There was no further description of the pregnancy and she did not write again until November when she was back on the farm caring for two sons. Subsequent births were announced when Patricia wrote that she was arranging for someone to help at home during what she began to call, quote, my usual two weeks in hospital holiday. And this contrasted with Patricia's detailed attention to the bodies and health of her family. In their cases, she carefully recorded Plunkett visits, the weight of babies, and the course and treatments of everyone's ailments. 
in March of 1946, she wrote that she had a headache and the doctor had ordered her to bed on the threat of admission to hospital. Patricia described her symptoms alongside what she called the summer sickness that she said was shared by all members of her family. It was only when she announced that her new daughter put it in her appearance in mid-April that I realized the doctor had been worried about potential problems with a pregnancy. <clears throat> Iris Nolan began her diaries in 1940 when she married Morris. Hers are appointment diaries containing brief regular entries. In this format, Iris signaled menstruation with an asterisk and speculated that the couple may have conceived using question marks. Sometimes she incorporated these visual symbols into sentences. In this way, Iris recorded the couple's difficulties conceiving over almost a decade. One entry predicted her due date based on the number of days since her last period. And Iris was close. The couple's daughter was born on the 19th of May, 1944 and their son was born in September 1949. Historians have identified Dyrus' use of visual codes to record menstruation and sex since the end of the 19th century, perhaps due to Victorian taboos. But Iris' use of symbols was an efficient means of recording the regular details of private life and aligned with theories and techniques of birth planning and birth control that had developed since the 1920s. Neither of these examples are catalogued under pregnancy. By the 1980s, however, new approaches to pregnancy made some women's personal accounts of the experience more visible within archival collections. In 1983, Anna Turner recorded her experiences in the commercial pregnancy diary, Sheila Kitzinger's birth book. Between its pages, Women read guidance authored by the British Advocate for Home Birth and Breastfeeding, illustrated with photographs by Suzanne Arms, who advocated for home birth in the United States. Anna enthusiastically filled all the spaces that were provided for diary entries, following the suggested intervals of weekly or fortnightly entries from six weeks of pregnancy until 12 weeks after birth. She stapled in eight typed sheets that described the birth of her daughter on the 2nd of January, 1984. <clears throat> the space for her intimate accounts was opened by 20th century developments, including the explosion of advice literature, greater attention to the emotional dimensions of pregnancy and parenting, and the growing home birth movement. A local home birth association had been established in Auckland, where Anna lived, in 1978, and childbirth and midwifery became increasingly politicised in New Zealand. A large portion of Anna's diaries records her ultimately unsuccessful efforts to give birth in this way. In 1970, there were only 87 home births in New Zealand. Numbers increased after 1972, but it remained a difficult task for Anna to find a midwife and a doctor to attend. The home birth movement provided one focus for Anna's account. For instance, she closely tracked and recorded the physical sensations of late pregnancy and early labor as part of her desire to avoid induction. However, the results of routine monitoring of Anna's pregnancy via her blood pressure and urine signaled the potential of preeclampsia and assigned her to birth in a hospital. This made Turner feel angry and hurt. In contrast, she and her partner embraced regular low tech medical management of her pregnancy. And this approach formed a parallel strand of her writing. Anna used a range of medical technologies to discover information and to seek reassurance. In July, she used a stethoscope to listen for the baby's heartbeat and heard nothing but my tummy rumbling. A few days later, the couple heard and recorded on tape the desired sound of a heartbeat, quote, chuffing away regularly. Anna was further reassured in early August when she felt the baby moving. 
She wrote that she quite often felt little knocks and twitches low down. It was really nice to know she's there and very much alive. An ultrasound scan at 17 weeks revealed the baby moving its hands and feet and turning over an active wee thing. In October, she used a mechanical counter to uh, monitor the number of times the baby moved within an hour and recorded the data on a homemade chart. Turner also tracked her weight, measured her stomach, and the couple purchased equipment to monitor her blood pressure at home. <clears throat> Developments in medicine, publishing, and advocacy provided new spaces for personal accounts of pregnancy that are easier to access in the archives. Identifying accounts put penned in the 1940s has required reading women's personal papers in full. In contrast, accounts from the 1980s appear by searching archival catalogues, albeit in small numbers. Together, these diaries highlight why I think it's worthwhile pursuing an intimate history of pregnancy. Public-facing sources such as medical manuals and advertising fail to address women's complex experiences, a pattern that continues until today. Only personal testimonies reveal the shifting set of influences and responses that have shaped private experience, including the intriguing possibility of coexisting medical and activist models of pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, so that is our last um, presentation for the evening. I'm going to hand over to Alicia um, for um, questions just for Charlotte. And then after that, we will open up to have questions for all of our presenters. Over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Susie. So yes, while uh, people pop their questions in the Q&A, um, I was really just struck. I, I really appreciated the three different women that you've highlighted in their, in their diaries and, and the different formats that, that they each used. Um, in particular, I enjoyed Iris's coded sort of examples of, of how she, she did things very, um, uh, I can't think of the word, but you know, she was only writing a little bit, right? In comparison to the other two. Yeah, and that's, that diary is very much in the mode of a kind of appointment diary, you know, very yes. everyday records, um, but I think still quite um, can tell us a lot about mm. that couple's private experiences. And actually, there's a wonderful diary to work with because I also have love letters that was written that were written between them before they got married. Mm. Um, and actually, the kind of expansive and expressive nature of love letters um, really contrast with that kind of daily routine communication about kind of the body. Um, yeah. And actually the love letters, I found just by putting love letters into that archival catalog, whereas, you know, you're not going to get that kind of result. It's not going to pick up Iris's diary. Yes. Uh, but so it's a really nice kind of contrast. Yeah, it really is. And then um, I think, you know, on the screen, we've still got, Anna's um, reflections and I was just struck with how we're now looking at a, a commercial something she could have bought at the shops or lots of other people presumably could have bought at the shops um, so it's much more um, kind of a facilitated journey through your yeah. own reflections. Yeah that's right um, and one thing that does is um, you know put pregnancy in that catalogue record because it's a specifically designed pregnancy diary um, and I think it's also wonderful to see how those kind of printed prompts exist alongside women's own personal writing um, mm. and Anna kind of although she follows the format um, she does kind of like squeeze writing into all the gaps she staples in some extra pages um, so um, so she's really but she's really like strongly responding to the kind of reflections that are being encouraged I think Mm. And, and going back to your, your first person, to Loris, and, and thinking about that idea of the relationships between couples, um, Al's asked a question here that 
um, she could confide in her male partner about her pregnancy, but no one else. So do you get a sense that it was common for women to encourage uh, their partners to be involved in their pregnancies at that time? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a wonderful example. It, it seems somewhat unexpected um, that there would be that openness um, include, I mean, about pregnancy and also about her, her body and her pregnant body. And she writes about how her husband really kind of appreciates the way that she looks during pregnancy and gives her compliments um, and as well as kind of sharing these physical sensations. Um, and it's a wonderful kind of opening up, I think, of our sense of who was giving support to women um, and how pregnancy was experienced. Yeah. Um, that that marriage and the, the the striking contrast is between pregnancy and then what happens once children arrive. Mm. So what, once children arrive, um, Loris does not feel like it's a shared project in the same way. Um, sh she she is very much responsible for childcare, and she contributes to Trevor's work. So he's a school teacher, and she helps him do um, preparation work as well. Um, and this is kind of like an interesting generational question, I think, because women who are in their 20s and the 40s are in the 1940s are then reflecting back on those relationships and domestic structures in the 60s and 70s and afterwards in the context of the women's liberation movement. Um, mm -hmm. And so you get these really explicit kind of reflections on how that worked. Um, and then for creative women, and all of these women were writers in different kind of ways mm. um, then you then you kind of get this movement to express um the, the kind of private experience um and and how they feel about it later as well as at the time yes and sort of thinking about you know some of your um subjects have written those diaries for just so long um you know obviously very committed to that um, approach and sort of thinking about well who are they writing for and um, you know are they sort of conscious of writing for themselves or, or is there another audience in mind do you think? Yeah that's that's a really good question so um, they are all writers in some in different forms so um, mm -hmm. Loris Edmund is a very successful um, poet in autobiographer later in life um, but the others um, Iris Nolan writes for travel magazines Mm -hmm. um, Laura Sedman is writing poetry by herself at night, even kind of earlier in life when she's not thinking of it as a career. Um, and uh, yeah, all of them are involved in writing in some way. Uh, and I, I, I think it's also something that comes through in the later decades of the 20th century is the kind of drive to express these experiences, which is somewhat at odds with the small number of sources in the archives. Um, and, and yet when you do get some of these diaries and letters, there is a strong sense that I think that women want to share, share these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a, I think it's a main, a kind of key strand of, of the project is when women talk about this, when they talk about it publicly, when it's collected and archived or not. Yes. Um, yeah, as a window onto the experience. Thank you, Charlotte. I feel like we could keep asking questions, but we're, I'm going to pass to Susie because we're all going to join in the Q&A from now. Yes, please. If I could get um, Paula and Liz to, to join, uh, turn your screens on and join in the general Q&A and I will disappear again for a while. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can't see you yes. so we need to get Al to to put me back on again he because he turned me off because <laughs> <laughs> well because I forgot to turn myself off earlier okay so if um Al Thank or you. Susie could restart Liz's camera no luck yet I have no control over these yep, yep. There you are. Okay. You're back. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we've got you all back, and we've got we've got a bunch of questions and a couple of our a couple that our panelists have answered behind the scenes. Um, so we might we might jump into a couple. Liz, going back to you right at the 
right at the beginning, we had some questions. Um, and I think it'd be worthwhile just sort of um, sharing them with the rest of our audience. Um, Christine's got a question about what do you think Jolliffe's influence was on formulating popular opinion and attitudes to Aboriginal women in the popular magazines of the 1970s? Uh, okay, so Eric Jolliffe had hundreds of booklets and he had um, Witch of His Tribe. Um, I, don't, I don't have my notes with me, but, but all of this I wrote up for the Mianjin piece a couple of years ago. I think he was very influential. He also had an Aboriginal readership purportedly, um, uh, according to uh, Aboriginal people, and um, it, particularly in the North, and news agents and Jolliffe himself. And Jolliffe very much drew on that as a defence um, when the Redfern Aboriginal uh, Legal Service made a complaint against him through through the Australian Anti-Discrimination Board in New South Wales. Yeah. Um, so how influential was him? Was he, like I said, uh, with the earlier question, it's very hard to, to measure influence. And, um, you know, I mean, he was, his work was quite varied, in fact. So one of my favourite cartoons is one of his, and it's a group of Aboriginal people walking past a a boab tree, an enormous boab tree that's shaped like a wine bottle and in the top is a cork and on the trees is inscribed Leichhardt 1848, I think the year is the, is the year Leichhardt the explorer went missing up north and the one of them turns to the rest of them and says a very good year. Um, and so um, he, it, it was quite varied, he tended to play on, on um, you know, the kind of disparity or the dissonance between Aboriginal people um, subscribing to modern ideas of domesticity when they didn't have the means as they were living tribally. So, for example, Aboriginal women would compare brightness, even though they didn't have washing machines. And I mean, I guess, I guess he very much resisted the idea that there were, you know, predominantly urban living Aboriginal people um, uh, he wanted to attach to this notion of authenticity um, very much around tribally living, desert, li desert living Aboriginal people. Um, so I think there was um, a quite a widespread attachment to that, to that notion um, that, that, that urban, urban living Aboriginal people weren't authentic. Aboriginal people mm. and I mean it's very damaging it's still in play and, and it, it, it's very racist um, and so I guess although there was quite a bit of variation in his in his cartoons it's it's, it's a more complex picture than just the one I showed you that the, that the complaint was about mostly he wanted to ascribe a, a kind of authentic Aboriginal living to living tribally and traditionally Mm. And he dismissed the complaint against him on those grounds too. Mm. But he was very, very widely read. Um, so the influence, I guess, is, is a matter of um, reception and theories of readership. Mm. So sort of taking that idea of imagery, I might ask each of you to reflect on, you know, how is it that the mothers in the, um, the period under study for each of you how were they depicted at the time? And, you know, how did that influence sort of popular thinking around mothers? So maybe over to you, Paula. Yeah, so um, the Soviet Union, like, um, like other East European countries after World War II had an official kind of pronatalist stance. And so mothers were depicted in this very um, you know, exultant, celebratory way as, and in fact, there were awards. If you had six or more children, um, you, would, you would get a medal for mm -hmm. being the mother hero and, and you would get um, compensation from the state um, by having large families because about 27 million Soviet citizens perished during World War II. And the, so the state was very preoccupied with getting women to have more babies. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the primary image of the mother. By the time you get to the, the 60s and especially the 1970s, there's a shift to depicting um, mothers in very materialistic terms and um, as uh, kind of 
these sort of demanding shrews who um, put the screws to their husbands to be providers and see them as some kind of Soviet version of an ATM machine. So there's a bit of a vilification of, of mothers as, as very materialistic or women of that age of, uh, as materialistic. But in general, there's a, a celebration of motherhood. Yeah. So sort of value, valuing that repopulation of the, of the nation sort of idea. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Charlotte? How has the mother been depicted in New Zealand, the New, New Zealand context? Uh, I guess one thing about um, New Zealand, we have a really strong um, organisation, the Plunkett Organisation for, for Child Child Health and Health, um, and and that uh, advice and that kind of involvement of Plunkett nurses has laid down some really strict kind of rules for parenting um, since the beginning of the 20th century, really, mm. um, that focus on um, the kind of the mother's approach to routine and measured through success of, of weight gain of her baby, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, and you can really trace in women's writing and oral history interviews how much this kind of interaction effect has affected them, you know, emotionally um, and their understanding of, of their own mothering mm. um, in a whole range of ways. I mean, some, some women felt very rebellious about this um, and others um, really upset and distressed by it and, and still others really supported by it. Uh, another interesting thing about New Zealand is that um, and around the time of women's liberation, there's actually quite a lot of organizing around childhood education. I mean, Plunkett was always um, run also by, by groups of women. And so there's kind of a space for later women to to organize uh, in a kind of um, inspired by feminist kind of formats that also takes in some of these areas of life, which is a little bit different from, from Australia, for example, I think where there's a like harder separation between women's liberation movement and the interest in, in motherhood and parenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and I've got a question here around from Carla around pros and cons of different kinds of historical sources to chart these histories. Um, so I might return to Liz, but again, ask each of you to um, answer those questions. So Liz, what are your thoughts? Um, well, it's kind of sifting against different kinds of, um, you know, within different kinds of archives. I mean, I think that that this kind of imagery has a, has a particular intention. Um, you, ha you have to keep that in mind. Um, it has, it draws on particular um, conventions and traditions, visual, and that has to be present to, to the way you sift through it. And then I'm not really, I guess, taking a, an art historical approach where I'm sort of a, a more traditional art historical approach where I might be writing the biography of the artist and, and, and how the image was produced, but I'm very interested in um, more the circulation of the images and how that was enabled through the industrialization of print at this time. So um, as a source, what can it ca cartoons tell us? Um, I guess they can be a portal into some thinking that, that is, um, you know, in, in the sense that cartoons always transgress some standards and norms of, of, of decorum in some ways. I guess that they can be quite powerful ways to read uh, things that uh, were considered unsayable or, you know, better not to say, um, but they're going to leap in there anyway um, and, and be edgy and, and flout, flout kind of conventions and norms to make these statements, these visual statements. So in some way they might uh, be a bit of a portal into a, a kind of consensus of thinking um, that wasn't perhaps considered decorous to, to, to say out loud. That might be something that we could think about cartoons. Thanks, Liz. And Paula, what about your thoughts around different historical sources? Yeah, I would say Soviet historians are coming, are in a bit of a different position than either Australianists or New Zealandists. Is that what you call them? <laughs> um, 
uh, in that um, our archives are very state-centered. And so getting at um, private life is a real challenge because you have to read, read the archive against the grain. Um, you have to find alternative sources. And so it's a kind of beggars can't be choosers situation. Um, and I think methodologically it behooves us to be um, eclectic and you know, always reading critically, but being open to, to, to finding sources wherever we can. And that's what led me to turn in this instance to try to recover women's voices by turning to literature, even though I'm not a literary scholar. Yeah, absolutely. And Charlotte, and I think this uh, might be our last answer for the evening. So over to you, Charlotte. Yeah, um, well, Carla's own research on, on motherhood in Australia, you know, shows us how, how parenting and motherhood has been such a vulnerable um, kind of moment and also really inspiring moment. Um, for many people and and I think that uh, the kind of emotional depth of that experience um, is missing from a lot of discussion now in public uh, about motherhood but also in the past um, and so you know I have this real kind of hunger to to write that history in a way a history of, of some of the conversations we have and don't have now by looking back to those private private sources um, but I think reflecting on tonight, like what 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 wonderful papers using such an incredible range of sources in creative ways, um, you know, I, I just I just think it shows how many possibilities there are for accessing this history. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Thanks all of you, and I'll pass back to Susie. So thank you, um, Charlotte, Paula, and Liz for your presentations today. And thank you to our audience for coming along and participating. I just need to now um, thank our sponsors, Monash University Publishing, um, who have sent gifts to the speakers today um, on our behalf to thank you for um, your hard work. So thank you, Monash UP. And just want to mention the final Making Public History seminar for the year, which is coming up in November. Um, it's going to be on child labour and slavery. Um, I forget what the long title is, but it will be to mark the UN um, year. Oh, there it is. It's in front of me. Great. The International Year for the Elimination of Child Labour. Um, so that's going to be, I'll be speaking there uh, together with Professor Jane Martin and Dr. Claire Lowry. So please come and join us for that. And um, thank you again for this evening. Good night. Don't forget to look out for the recording. <laughs>